is on. This is me. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about social engineering and open source intelligence. Um, so talk a bit about what OSINT is and why OSINT is important for social engineering. Um, a bit about what social engineering is and um, talk about the social engineering engagement model pretext. Um, I'll give some sort of case studies of some things I've done um, as a social engineer. So across um, the UK, Europe and the US, I've done this kind of all over the place. Um, and I've got some tools, um, some resources. I've even got a, I've even created a, a mini capture the flag as well for people to um, test their OSINT skills as well as part of this talk as well. So you can, you can use that. Uh, a bit about me. Um, so yeah, I do some you know, training and education. I do instant response. Um, I do lots of talks and I've done um, quite a lot of work on uh, social engineering and open source intelligence. Um, if anyone doesn't know, I do um, have won the um, Trace Labs Global Missing Person CTF um, three times, which is uh, it's a really good competition. Uh, people use their OSINT skills to find real missing people uh, in a kind of CTF. Um, I host the Many Hats Club. I've done some stuff online and I volunteer at the National Child Protection Task Force, which um, I started doing that possibly sort of March time this year. And then this year also raised um, some money for both Trace Labs and um, for uh, the NCTPF, PTF, sorry, um, for about $19,000, I think I raised uh, one of the conferences that I hosted this year called Conint. So there's my socials and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just keep going. Right, so I have a bit of an unusual journey into InfoSec, if, if anyone doesn't know. So I started off, I went to university and I studied pottery or ceramics, um, which is an unusual kind of path into InfoSec. I uh, decided I wasn't really that interested in making pots and stuff. So then I ended up in the wonderful world of information security recruitment, um, probably back in 2002, 2003. And uh, from there, I decided that uh, I did lots of lots of skills I learned for open source intelligence and things like this was actually learned there. Um, finding candidates um, uh, weren't on job boards and things like this. Um, Dorking was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty important to me at the time. And I, I've got very good at it. So um, one of my clients headhunted me. So then I ended up working in uh, InfoSec and all that kind of stuff and uh, ended up starting off doing the social engineering side, uh, mainly the sort of telephone phishing and phishing stuff. And then I moved into much broader information security, such as instant response and a whole range of other things, which is quite cool. Um, as I said, I did the uh, Trace Lab CTF, um, found won it, got my black badge and all that kind of cool stuff this year. So, um, so we won that. We've now retired from doing that and do judging and stuff like that, which is quite cool. Um, right. Okay. So. Um, this is also, I like this talk to be interactive. So if you want to ask me any questions at any time, please do so. I don't mind that at all. I'm quite used to it. So if you want to ask me a question, uh, just unmute yourself and ask me. I'm absolutely fine with that as well, by the way. So um, that's pretty cool. Right. So OSINT really is um, the term um, using publicly available sources um, uh, to collect information uh, across multiple sources and actually generate intelligence. So turn that in data into intelligence of some description. Um, and really in the context of this talk, we're looking um, to build intelligence on a target to perform some form of social engineering. So maybe to create a pretext or to find information on a company to be able to get into that organization of some description. Um, really what we're talking about is um, more than running tools. So most people when they do OSINT, they'll run like, uh, they'll talk about recon. So if you're doing a pen test, you know, you'll be doing some kind of recon of domain names or, um, data breaches or things like this to build some form of reconnaissance for a, for a pen test or red team engagement. When I'm talking about the kind of the more detailed OSINT, we're talking about building much more of a profile on an individual or the company itself to understand the weak points where you can get in from a, from a social engineering point of view. So it's more about um, following the data um, and your investigative gut as it is about the tools that you would run. So it's actually doing something with that data, if that makes sense. Um, so obviously things like, you know, most of the intelligence work I do is actually using browsers, um, but I do occasionally use Kali or Parrot, or I might use um, some of the OSINT VMs, which I'll talk a bit about later. Um, I might use tools like Hunchly, which is a really good case management tool, though it's not free, it's, it's very, very good. Um, OSA, which is basically the open source uh, intelligence browser, which is, is pretty good, although it's not supported as much anymore, So, but it still works, um, and, and tools like Multigo and things like this. Um, but ultimately, the, the key here is to be able to analyze 
um, the, the data and turn it into some form of intelligence. And really how I would go about this would be to, to look at, um, you know, doing some kind of target selection. So scraping social media, um, domain mapping, maybe looking at the tech stack that an organization may use, um, doing some kind of data harvesting. So maybe that's some automated collection using something like Multigo or something like that. Um, maybe do some uh, public records or database um, sort of scraping, um, looking at forums, paste the dark net, uh, doing some Google dorking and things like this. Um, then process that data. So um, putting it into some kind of visualization tool potentially, um, or using a case management tool to actually then categorize that data and, and analyze that data. Um, and then to go through and aggregate the data um, and perform some kind of investigation. Um, at which point then I'd look at um, some form of analysis. So what date, what have I learned from that data? Is there anything I can pivot off? Um, is there any, um, is there any kind of potentially some kind of um, pretext I can use from that data or can I then, you know, pivot to um, with the knowledge I've got to, to actually get more information. Sometimes that might involve new keywords and going back to the well and actually pivoting off that completely until I've got as much as I can and I can use that to, to generate some, you know, use that intelligence to actually do something with. And in the case of this talk, it will be to create some form of, you know, pretext um, for some, some kind of attack. Um, really for me, you know, the starting points, um, obviously you want to start with your targets names. If, you, if you're going after a particular target, for example, so you might look at their social media handles. Um, you might want to pivot off their friends, family, known contacts if, you, if you're going down that route, which of course, probably for a, um, probably for a social engineering engagement, you, you probably wouldn't. Um, but if you're, say, looking for a missing person, you definitely would go that way. Um, email, you know, addresses, telephone numbers, um, any kind of intelligence on their kind of, you know, backgrounds, um, you know, all that kind of stuff you would want to look at. Gaming handles are fantastic, by the way. Um, you can get quite a lot of people's gaming handles um, and lots of intelligence. Um, for me, you know, this is what social engineering is like. It's um, and, and especially in the open source or sourcing side, it's really about you know trying to um, be an observer. So when anyone does any form of intelligence, and we, I've seen this quite a lot, people start doing recon of people, and then they try and go for the password reset links to try and guess email accounts, and in most cases that might trigger um, some kind of alert to the user. And so when you're going through any kind of reconnaissance activity at all on any kind of target, um, you really should just be an observer. Um, you shouldn't be interacting, liking um, anything with any kind of post. And I've, I've seen this quite a few times. And in fact, even when I've set challenges and stuff, I know that someone's investigating um, the accounts I've created because they've accidentally liked something. So already I've got an alert saying, well, someone's you know, tripped up or something. So you, you could be tripping off a target potentially. Um, or you could be, if you're doing an investigation into um, a threat actor or, or maybe someone who's gone missing or some kind of criminal group or something like that, you could make you could include yourself in that evidence as well, which is obviously quite bad. Um, so I thought I'd do a little bit of a, a search on myself um, using Multigo. So I just picked out two of the kind of usernames that, that I use. So one of them being my Twitter handle and one of them being the community I run to see where the links are. Um, between those so in this case it's my twitch um, and also looking at some of the people i might want to investigate as part of that for example um, i didn't decide to dump all my use uh, all my followers on twitter because that would actually completely crash my uh, multigo session but um you know it's about trying to pick out the kind of relevant people i might go to investigate and how i would then pivot from there um, what user accounts i would go after if, if i was targeting myself for example um, there's some pretty good tools to do um, if you don't want to use Multigo, if you want to use just some um, online tools, there's something called usersearch.org or, or the, the, the premium version which they have, which is usersearch.io. Um, these are some pretty good tools, um, free tools you can use to kind of enumerate usernames, um, or you could just go do some dorking and find if you've got a particularly good username, um, obviously go use like a, a Google Dork to find um, the URL of that person because that pretty much pick up all of their... Um, all of their things. And yes, um, someone added me to the Urban Dictionary, um, which is highly amusing. I only found that a few weeks ago. So yeah, that's always good fun. Um, and of course, image searching and reverse image searching is quite important as well. Um, there are a fair few images of me online, sadly. Um, I did spend many years ago, I did a talk on this. I did a talk on OPSEC maybe four years ago, three years ago, where I'd actually managed to delete all my images off online 
And then within two weeks of doing that talk, there was sort of like a hundred images of me back online again, because people had started creating images or creating memes and stuff like this. So that was always good fun. So now I have quite a few of those to search through and, and delete again. Um, also, uh, my favorite reverse image searching tools, probably still Yandex. Um, it's very, very useful for doing like uh, any kind of reverse image search. Um, but it turns out that my, uh, my profile picture is not quite as unique as I thought it was, um, which actually is quite good in some respects. Um, but the person that designed it for me didn't actually use a unique image, which is always quite nice and fun. Um, and of course, there's a really good tool. Um, Osync Combine have some really good free tools for username enumeration, uh, reverse image searching. They have a great snap map um, uh, as well, which actually you can, you can drill down into geolocation and find all the Snapchats and, and videos and things like this. Um, they've got some great tools for um, TikTok as well and things like this. So there's some really, really good tools that you can use that just, just by having a browser and finding some of the online tools. Um, and another one as well is um, what's my name. It's a good username enumeration tool. Again, so if you're going after a target, you can find out all the usernames. You can then start to do a little bit of investigation into those to build up a profile very, very quickly of your target and how you're going to go after them. Um, and, and really it's about pivoting, right? It's about pivoting um, from one target to another. So a, a while ago, and I've got a much bigger version of this, but I probably want to excuse everyone's eyes from the chaos of this diagram, but um, ultimately trying to find out how accounts are linked so you can pivot from one account to another and understand um, you know, where people might reuse handles for like Discord. They're probably going to use the same handle on stream, Steam, sorry. They're probably going to use the same Twitter handle um, and they're probably going to have you know, similar profile pictures and things like this. So really trying to understand where people might um, expose themselves. If you do manage to get their email address, where they're using their email address, um, you know, where they, if they've got a LinkedIn profile, have they, have they used the same profile picture, for example, for their Facebook profile? Um, they may have, you know, for example, reused their um, handle from Instagram on Twitter and Discord and all these kind of places. And before you know it, um, you've got a lot of data from one single point of entry. And that's really what, you know, OSINT's about. It's about pivoting from the data to get to everything you need to get to as quickly as possible um, so you can understand, okay, how am I going to target this individual um, or how am I going to learn something about this individual that as an attacker I could use later or if they've gone missing or something like that, how can I find out where they are, where their location is and things like this. Um, for me, um, job sites and job adverts are probably the best form of recon um, that you can do. Um, so if you're going as a, uh, I don't know, as a red teamer after an organization, you want to quickly look at what their tech stack looks like, going after job, uh, the job sites um, and, and looking at what jobs they're posting, especially on the tech side, will give you pretty much everything you need. So you can look at what their tech stack looks like. So what tools you've got to bypass. If I'm doing a phishing attack, I need to know, um, do they have an IDS or IPS in place? Um, you know, if I'm doing a black box exercise, which I do quite a lot, I need to work out how I'm going to get my phishing attack past their controls. What do I need to look at? And in this case, this particular organization has quite a lot. So um, I need to think about how I'm going to get my attack through all those controls undetected and then deploy my, um, my exploit or whatever I'm trying to deploy or if I'm just trying to get them to go to a phishing site, how I'm going to obfuscate that. Um, so, you know, when they do engage, it doesn't get blocked in the first place. Um, also, looking at um, mistakes in coding and things like this, or looking at where people um, uh, have got potential public repos and things like this, I like to go look at their repos and look for common mistakes. I think, for example, in this case, exposing secrets. Um, so, you know, just a quick dork within our, uh, just within GitHub alone will actually find me quite a lot about that organization. I can look for errors and mistakes. Um, the amount of times I find, you know, private RSA keys or uh, hard coded API keys in some cases hard-coded passwords so you know that there's a hygiene issue within this organization so again you can use that as a way to try and get in uh, maybe if they are using a public um, github repo maybe we're going to start looking at social engineering their developers um, by using a, a a kind of phishing attack against them using github or something like that um, again i found um, api keys and things like this as well so uh, usually we look at um, you know there's a whole range of things you can do to kind of uh, there's tools you can use, um, but there's also um, a whole range of um, recon tools. In fact, I found a good tool the other day as well. It does the same with um, uh, Azure and AWS, which finds uh, open exposed blobs and uh, data blobs or exposed S3 buckets um, as well. And there's, there's some good tools there to actually understand 
where that organization might be exposed further through other kind of attack vectors that you could try to look to exploit as well. So um, for me, it's about um, thinking about every piece of data is a clue. Um, and this is kind of how I, I think about everything. So, um, you know, think about, you know, where do they reuse their profile picture, usernames, uh, who's their friends, family circle, what can I learn from them? Where, what can I learn from their images and videos? Um, listening to podcasts actually as well, if your target's got a big public profile. Um, I've actually managed to get quite a few from listening to people's podcasts. Um, there was a, um, there's quite a few things where you can use um, tools like Trint, which is like a, um, it's a tool that basically an AI tool that scrapes, um, you upload an image or podcast or you point it to a podcast and it will just download uh, and, and transcribe the whole podcast. It's not very accurate, but it will give you, if you don't want to listen to a whole podcast, you will look for keywords. That's a quick way of doing it as well. Um, uh, so what can I learn from their videos and images and things like this? There's also some tools to download YouTube videos if you want to do that offline as well and actually uh, play around with that as well. Um, obviously looking into the exif of data as well and images, um, PDFs and things like this. If you find lots of files and PDFs, there's lots of good exif tools to get all of the uh, metadata and analyze the metadata so within, within images. And there's also tools you can use within Kali or Linux to do that, excuse me, but you can also do that on online as well. So lots of good online tools for these kind of things as well. Um, there's one called, I think it's um, exif.org, uh, I think it is, um, where you can get lots of, um, lots of good uh, metadata from just uh, uh, looking at images and things like this. Um, you can look at public records and things like this if they're not on social media um, and actually then pivot from their work colleagues or their friends list to actually get to that target. So there's been lots of cases where I've investigated uh, missing people that don't have any social media profiles, but managed to find a ton of data of them from their friends and family, um, online post news stories, and actually pivoted to find lots of information about that target, um, even though they didn't have a social media presence themselves. So the lack of a social media presence doesn't necessarily mean that um, you couldn't actually target that person or you couldn't find information about that person as well. Um, and, and people are, are creatures of habit. Um, so, you know, try and identify those common patterns and links so you know pre-covid world when we all didn't used to work from home we'd used to get you know we used to take the same journey to work or we would you know go to the same starbucks or coffee shop or you know whatever it may be we'd have like similar patterns that you know we would get used to and we'd find our favorite places so these are the kind of things that you can do um, even going to the same places on holiday some people like to go to the same place every year on holiday and um, one of the um, social engineering uh, uh, activities I did for a company recently was um, when I say recently pre um, when people were going on holiday and stuff was actually this person went to the same uh, place um, they'd just come back off holiday um, and we worked out where they went to and they um, left a, a review on on TripAdvisor and we we're actually able to find out where it was and then we actually sent them a, a, a message saying thank you very much for your stay at our recent place um, we'd like you to leave, you know, like to leave you with a, a voucher for next time for when you come to stay with us again. Um, here's a, a link to like 20% off um, and also a PDF, which had like a, a, an exploit running in it as well. And so when they opened up the exploit to get the voucher code, we're able to get onto their machine, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's, there's different ways of different ways of doing things. Right. Um, and, and this is kind of how, you know, using those small bits of information to get, you know, get, get a, a, a link. And, and you can also do this, you know, um, there are um, ways of practicing your kind of OSINT skills, you know, whether it's geolocation type uh, kind of challenges on Twitter. So there's a, uh, a good friend of mine uh, called Sid Windy on Twitter just started something called the OSINT Dojo, um, where he's going to post out a bunch of challenges every week. And you can go through this whole process of um, going through different challenges and it's free to join. And it's all about trying to improve your OSINT skills. And there's, there's different ways of doing that, whether it's like saying you've competed in competitions and completing a number of challenges and doing write-ups and really showing how you improve your skills over time. But there's a bunch of stuff you can do online. So I, I do these weekly challenges anyway, um, where you know geolocations is a good example here. It's just a, an image post of what's the longitude, latitude and longitude. So I took this image and I just went, right, where, where was it? So it's golden TU something. I knew it was in Africa because the flags. Um, so I thought, right, how am I going to find this place? And all I did was just do a little bit of a dork uh, and found, you know, I didn't know it was a T or an I or an E. So I just tried TI Africa or TU Africa and TU Africa brought up Golden Tulip. I found Golden Tulip and thought, well, it's got to be in South Africa. Or it's got to be in Ghana. 
So I just tried South Africa and there was loads of hotels and I couldn't find it. So I tried Ghana. There's only one in Ghana. And obviously then I w- when I hit Google, uh, Google Maps, um, found this location. This took me about what, 10 minutes, if that, to find this. So, you know, you can do some really cool stuff just by looking at images and, and trying to pivot from these things quite quickly. Um, and, and doing these kind of challenges are quite useful for, for anything. If people are posting stuff on social media, you can look at the background of their image. Are they leaving passwords in the background? Are they, what type of machine are they running? Um, you know, you can learn a lot about, um, you know, people obviously post their badges online all the time, which is great for when you're doing physical stuff. So this is all kind of very, very useful. But ultimately, there's lots of good free challenges. Um, there's something, uh, a guy called um, Sector35, um, he runs a uh, part of the quiz type, part of the quiz time crew, and they do like different kind of OSINT challenges every day on Twitter. So it's definitely worth doing that. But he also has his own challenge, which I will share the details with you guys afterwards, which would go through everything from um, social media OSINT right through to geolocation, dark web, everything. And it's a really good challenge, actually. Um, and it's all done over email and stuff. And you, it's, it's, um, it's definitely worth doing. It's, it's about 25 of challenges and uh, they get progressively harder. And if you want to test yourself, it's, it's, it's pretty good fun. So, um, so you know, how, how do social engineers use OSINT and why, why, what's really useful? So, you know, ultimately, a bunch of tools you can use online. There's a whole range of tools you can use. There's a whole range of websites you can use. You know, there's a whole range of stuff, right? And ultimately, it's about collection of that data and, and processing of that data and doing that kind of analysis. Um, and, and then ultimately, as I said, it's, it's using that to pick out the best scenario for attack and how are you going to do that, right? What, what are you going to do with that data? And, and like I said, it's finding um, the, the kind of the, the key things that you can use in a, in a scenario if you're doing things like spear phishing attacks or something like that um, can be incredibly useful. Um, so when it comes down to um, social engineering, um, it's all about trying to find the target, um, or working with your, what, who you're going to target, using that data to generate the pretext to engage with that target um, and then to exit with some kind of action, whether it's uh, um, getting their username or password or whether it's doing um, dropping some kind of um, flag on the system or whether it's actually breaking into a building, as I've done many a times, um, and actually trying to get out with some kind of sense information or planting something on the network. Um, so it just depends on what, what the, the scenario is, really. Um, and it's all about trying to build the, um, I guess, the, the trust, right, and try to establish some form of trust and, you know, you need to have initially some kind of form of credibility. Uh, and once you have credibility, you then need to think about empathy, um, or whether it's um, likability or authority. But really, if you don't have credibility right from the outset, so if you're sending someone a really dodgy looking link from a Gmail account, you're probably not going to get credibility. So thinking about how you do domain spoofing or, tar- or, or if you can't spoof it because they've got um, you know, they've got their SPF set up correctly and they've got DMARC and DKIM and all that kind of stuff, then you're going to have to think about typo squatting and things like this. So registering a domain that looks fairly similar that might catch someone out. And then think about, you know, how you're going to get through that process, whether you want to go through some kind of um, authority mo- uh, motion or whatever it may be. And if you're doing the, the telephone phishing, that's slightly easier. You can spoof your caller ID and then you can then start thinking about how you're going to use that information to try and uh, build that credibility quite quickly uh, using authority or empathy and things like this. Um, and ultimately, it's really understanding these kind of needs and motivations. So you've got the right at the bottom, you've got like the um, the, the physiological needs, um, although you can, you know, there are some ways where people can export that and exploit such as exhortation or manipulation and those kind of sides and extortion. But realistically, most of it's going to be um, targeting someone's um, esteem or um, you know uh, greed or freedom at the kind of engaged level right at the top here really if you've got you know that kind of um, aligning aligned to someone's core beliefs or personal goals you know that's going to be really really good to do that um, so thinking about how what you're going after and and the size of the engagement so I've had social injury engagements that have gone on for a few days and it's a really small exercise I've had ones that have gone on for um, weeks and weeks and weeks um, trying to get a, a route into an organization. It just depends on what the outcome of the engagement is. Um, and I guess also, um, just to be very clear as well, that also making sure that once you've done that kind of engagement, you don't leave a negative impression. So someone should really come away from this um, afterwards, realizing that 
um, they may have been tricked, but it was a it was a test not to test them to test whether the company could detect it, and ultimately they may have failed that. But you know, there's an opportunity to learn from this rather than to punish, if that makes sense. I'm not really these people that goes around and says you were social engineered. Um, good luck with that. It's very much about how do you build that trust and rapport afterwards, and how do you debrief those people so they can actually learn to identify those signs, um, and you know, try and make some obvious mistakes in some cases if you want people to spot it in some cases you make it very difficult um, it depends on what again the engagement is and what you're trying to get out of it but there are kind of rules of influence um, and these are the kind of things that you know you can you can always um, always kind of look at and you know generally speaking a lot of attackers will will use urgency urgency seems to be the primary one um, so and people are, uh, are kind of influenced by that because we're used to deadlines and we're used to getting urgent notifications about everything. When everything's urgent, how do you stand out from the crowd? Um, and obviously ransomware also exploits that by putting big ticking clocks on their ransomware notifications. So that always drives some form of urgency. Uh, likeability isn't really used that much um, by attackers, but I use it quite a lot because it actually works quite well. Um, people generally don't feel that nice people are threatening. Um, and if you come across really well and really friendly, obviously not too friendly because that raises all different kinds of suspicions. But if you come across as a kind of nice guy and you you're just, you know, people are more likely to want to help you. Um, authority, of course, everyone's used to that kind of chain of authority. So again, it's quite difficult to, um, you know, get that across in some cases, unless you are a genuine figure of, figure of authority or you've been given authority, which is what I usually use. Um, I've been given authority by this person to do this. Um, and that works quite well. Social proof. Um, again, there's been many cases where social proof is used. Um, uh, highly, highly convinced, you know, people will, uh, we are social creatures and so if enough people are doing something or, or seem to be doing something then um, we all seem to follow suit um, and commitment and, and reciprocity as well is obviously quite a um, if I do something for you and get some kind of verbal or oral commitment in return um, generally people are, are, are more likely to do something and you know um, like I said it's about in a bit more detail it's about trying to find the right people with the privileged access, access to money, or, or a good digital footprint, ideally. Um, you know, using that open source intelligence to uh, gain uh, some kind of um, uh, understanding of who you're targeting and why you're targeting them and what the outcome would be. be. And the better uh, and more recent you do, the better the kind of uh, pretext will be and therefore the better the outcome of that social engineering engagement will be. Um, and, and again, it's about, you know, creating that scenario and making sure the pretext is as realistic as you can possibly make it. The more crazy and um, out there your pretext is, and I've seen some really crazy ones, um, the less likely it's going to be successful. So if you haven't understood what your, your target or who you're trying to target they do and the culture of their organization and what they're more likely to, um, you know, to see as a realistic scenario, um, the less likely you're going to be successful. And I've seen this so many times where, um, you know, that you haven't had time for good research. And you have to go for, well, this is the best scenario we can come up with, given the time we've got. And it's just worked. But it was, you know, hit and miss whether it'd work or not. Um, and there's been some cases where um, the pretext is literally just see if you can get into the building. Right. Doesn't matter how you get in. Can you get in? And we're going to give you a small time window because we don't want to go for a sophisticated attack. We want to see if someone can just tailgate in or someone can bypass our perception and things like this. And those ones are quite good fun because you literally have to try anything you can. Um, but it's not really a, um, a super sophisticated attack. Um, so really, it's about trying to understand what you're trying to do from that engagement. So, you know, like I said, you've got phishing, baiting, pretext, phishing, quid pro quo, all those kind of great things which work quite nicely. And, you know, really it's about, you know, the kind of three things that I, I would usually do is like phishing. So obviously, you know, passwords or dropping some kind of malware or whatever it may be. Um, phishing, so um, looking to do some kind of recon uh, or sometimes get passwords over the phone. And I have managed to get passwords over the phone quite a few times, believe it or not. Um, it's easier than you believe. And of course, um, obviously the physical side, getting access to sensitive information or sensitive areas of a building such as data centers or things like this, um, or getting some kind of network access or um, simulating some kind of physical malware drop onto the network, or even, you know, the whole USB drop still works now again, but you just post it these days and people generally will plug them in still as well. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear the audio for this. This is a call I did um, a little while ago but I've managed to 
Um, it's long enough after the event that um, it's still sanitized, but the, you know, obviously you can't guess who the real people are. But this is a, a cool idea that um, hopefully should give you a, a bit of an idea of how easy this thing is to, to do social engineering on the phone. So hopefully this plays. <laughs> Hello, uh, Amy. In what department? Uh, social media. Copy. Sort of, uh, I guess, marketing. Okay, continue. Hi, Charlotte speaking. Oh, it's after Amy. She's around. Amy. Okay, but um, have I got through the right department? Oh, no problem. I can pass you over. She's just sitting next to me. Okay, well, maybe you can help. It's, it's absolutely fine. Um, I'm not on the same team, so I'll just transfer you over <laughs> if that's all right. <laughs> that's absolutely fine. That's <laughs> Great, fine. thanks. No uh, all of your... Hello? Hey, is that Amy? Yes, speaking. Amy, it's John from First Choice IT. How are you? Hi, good, thanks. Yeah, good. I'm um, just doing a bit of database work at the moment with you guys, um, just checking Windows accounts and all that kind of stuff. I just want to double-check. Have you had any issues logging in today at all? No, no issues. No issues? Okay, fantastic. When, when did you last log in today? Sorry? When did you last log in today? Were you log, logged in this morning? Hello? Are you, were you logged in this morning? Have you logged in? What time did you log in today? Um, twice, I think. It's been fine. Twice. Okay, fantastic. And can I confirm your email address just so I can uh, check the system to check uh, if you've got any issues with the database? Sure, Amy. What do you say? Amy. UK. And what's your Windows username? It's not your email address. Um, it's the. It's different, isn't it? So. It's fantastic. Uh, have you changed your password in the last thirty days at all? This is a first day no. update. Okay. Can you confirm the length of your password to me, please, as well, just so I can check. The length of it? Yes, please. Eight. Eight characters. Uh, how many of those are uppercase? None. None. Okay, fantastic. Any numbers at all in there? Yeah. How many numbers? Just so I can check. Two. Two numbers. Fantastic. Okay, let me just check. And you're logged in at the moment, did you say? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I can't see that. Um, okay, that's fantastic. Can you confirm what your password is, just so I can check the system, please? Um, I'm not really sure. I suppose. No, it's absolutely fine. We've got, we've got authorization from the head office, so it's absolutely fine. Say again, sorry? Brilliant. I'll just double check for you, so that's absolutely fine. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. So, in that scenario, um, the person uh, who uh, did a really good job. She actually uh, tried to stop me from getting her password, but I used the authority card to say, I've been given authority to do this, it's absolutely fine. And then she gave me her password. Um, and it's really simple. And I got passwords from this organization pretty much quite a lot of the time. Um, I've managed to get like 20 or so from this particular organization. So these are things which you can do quite easily. Um, you know, if you've got the, a, a good pretext, in fact, that pretext was pretty basic, to be honest, and it, it worked pretty well. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of things which can be quite easily um, delivered by an attacker and can have pretty big impact. Actually, that person also used the password across all of their social, corporate social media accounts. Uh, and we're able to validate that because um, we're also doing a red team engagement on site and we're able to kind of validate that as well. So it was, um, it was a, a pretty good attack in total. Um, and, and, you know, the kind of physical stuff is slightly different, really, um, from, a, from a social engineering perspective. It's really about trying to you know, do the same sort of process, but really it's about potentially badge creation. So you might do some badge creation, you might, um, you might do some of the vishing, um, you know, the tailgate, um, pretext impersonations, things like this. Uh, and, and then you might want to look at um, doing some on-site recon as well as part of that um, and trying to capture the evidence. And, and, and of course, there's the on-the-fly countermeasures that you need to think about as well. Um, so things like changing outfits or a backup pretext or, or changing location and, and if you think you've been discovered and I've had quite a few occasions where I've gone into buildings and I've been discovered and I've managed to talk my way out of it and there's been quite a few cases where I've been absolutely busted um, and I've had to then explain I'm here to do a test and you've discovered me but not after I then managed to walk out with all the stuff I wanted to anyway because uh, I didn't check my bag uh, on the way out so there's been a whole range of things which um, which again um, 
you know we've actually done and also things like fiscal security policies they might have a good fiscal security policy but testing that's quite good as well so there was one uh, landmark that i did um fairly recently um a little while before lockdown um where they had a very good fiscal controls um and we got in and i managed to get in eventually by um working out they did tours of this building like because it's a big landmark and so i managed to get on a tour and, and break away with a, a guest pass and ironically, the guest pass gave me access to everything. Um, so they'd obviously misconfigured all their guest pass. I was able to go around the building, come in and out all the time and actually check where um, you know, these guys had, uh, were supposed to check bags on the way in, way out. But if you'd been out, if you come out for the building and go into a different e entrance, they wouldn't check your bag. So you could then put something in your bag and then walk out with it or, um, or put something in your bag and walk in. Uh, without being checked so you completely bypass their entire process and there's a whole range of things which you know that were pretty pretty big uh, uh that, that kind of led to a whole range of potential uh, potential massive risks for that organization um, um so like here's an example um really good example of something i did um so this is a, a, a i wouldn't call it a government site but similar to um and the background to this was that there I am just tailgating in uh, there behind uh, the, the background here. There was actually a uh, another security gate that I tailgated in this particular organization had uh, pretty strict fiscal control policies. Um, this actually dropped me straight into their staff area. So there was no barriers, no fiscal barriers. And secondly, um, the recon I did also found out they had a staff shuttle bus. So all I had to do was get on the staff shuttle bus and then it would drop me into their special entrance here. And I was able to bypass all their controls once I tailgated in. So there's kind of things you can do quite to, to kind of get past a lot of these issues. Um, for me, uh, getting into a building, sit in a toilet cubicle, um, listen to conversations because people do talk in the toilets quite a lot. Um, and, and also buy yourself a, a five minute breather before moving on is, is also really, really important. That kind of five minutes when you're in a building, sit there and take a breather and you know get your head together um because you're once you're in you've got that adrenaline rush and it's trying to get past that adrenaline rush as well straight away um fishing for me is really important um you know i think what what's important is it still works and it still will work um obviously technical controls have got much better uh, and then everyone says oh you know we'll use 2fa um and that stops a lot of phishing attacks and it does um you know i've obviously started using uh, quite a few tools to start um, getting past uh, a lot of the um, 2FA um, type attacks, uh, so 2FA kind of controls in place. So obviously, um, you know, Evil Jinx and uh, Modlishka are, are fairly good for doing this. Um, Evil Jinx seems to be slightly better at the moment. Um, so basic proxies creates a proxy man in the middle attack essentially. So when someone clicks on a uh, on a link that's sent to them, all the traffic is proxied through um, my attacker server. And we can intercept the credentials onto the, the real uh, intercept the credentials that are being passed through to the real uh, website. Um, so a good example of this would be um, in this case, I registered a domain called uh, twitter.notanattacker.com. Uh, this is obviously the real Twitter login page. I'll try and log in as myself. Um, obviously still logged in there. Uh, asked me for my two effector, two factor authentication code for my uh, one of my apps. Um, so again, I uh, enter that, and of course, it's now being still being passed through the uh, my server. Um, I enter my code, and then of course, I've authenticated in, and of course, I'm still in, um, and of course, I can still use Twitter, um, but still being proxied through um, this session. Obviously, when I terminate this session, obviously that counts lost. But of course, all I need to do is just replay that token uh, through a cookie, and I can get straight into that account um, straight away. So these are kind of really good tools. The um, open source tools you can use for phishing, which are highly effective, and you can part. You can um, also maybe part this up with something like GoFish if you want to do it on mass, or if you want to do a spear phishing campaign. They're pretty good tools to use, really. Um, and, and a couple of slides left. You know, my social engineering toolkit for me. Uh, obviously, uh, hate mail is pretty good for sort of looking for uh, breaching. Obviously, I use Dehashed as well um, for for breached accounts, but hate mail is pretty good as well. Um, social engineering toolkit is quite good for doing some of those kind of um, targeted kind of uh, campaigns. Um, there are, it's, it's pretty good still, still works. Um, although, you know, there are some other tools out there you can use as well. Um, Proxmarks for the kind of physical stuff. If you want to do badge cloning, um, it's, it's pretty good. Proxmark 4 is pretty decent. Um, I'll use FireRTC. I have a FireRTC account. So, um, 
I was quite lucky to keep that account and I use it quite a lot for when I do lots of calls to the US and, and spoofing telephone numbers. There's also some other tools you can use and apps you can use, um, a spoofing card and things like this for the UK for spoofing other numbers. Um, creating sock puppet accounts, obviously this person does not exist, but actually then um, Photoshop that person into lots of images and change the position a bit because obviously all the eyes are in exactly the same position as you can probably see in this image here. Uh, Benjamin Street discovered that. Um, so they're all kind of in the same position, but you can move it around and make it a little more realistic. Uh, use fake name generator to build your kind of sock puppets as well. Hunchly for investigations. Uh, and I said evil jinx for some of the kind of more targeted spear phishing attacks and things like this. Um, some other tools and resources. Um, I created a um, spreadsheet, uh, Google Sheet, which has been uh, moved across to my uh, Many Hats Club GitHub fairly shortly, but it's still up and I can share. It's, it's my pinned tweet if you want to go and look at it. So uh, loads of resources for finding missing people or people in general. Um, there's about a thousand plus resources, um, which is pretty useful for, for getting into the kind of people side of OSINT. Um, obviously, OSINT Dojo, as I mentioned earlier by Sim Windy, is really, really good and definitely worth looking at. Um, if you want to start testing your geolocation and OSINT skills, quiz time is pretty cool. Um, obviously, I ran a conference this year called Conint, um, which is all about intelligence and um, all about sort of open source intelligence and, and other forms of intelligence. And there's a bunch of talks in there which I highly recommend. Um, to, to kind of broaden your horizons around OSINT. Um, so there's a the link to that. Uh, and then I'm also building uh, with some of my colleagues um, in the Many Hats Club, uh, something called Venari, which is a OSINT VM, um, which will be out hopefully next month. There's a bunch of tools in there as well. Um, a, whole bunch, a whole bunch of tools and some really good, um, some really, really good um, analytics stuff as well coming as part of it um, so it's not all the tools can be piped into an analytics tool um, that can then do a lot of analysis and also um, some visualization which you don't usually get in a lot of these tools so um, that's me I think uh, apart from the fact which I'll drop this link into a chat somewhere I'll share it with you guys I put together a very quick and dirty challenge on finding me um, so uh, some stuff around some stuff I've done and some other bits um, to just test your OSINT skills. It's just a Google Drive and the, each challenge unlocks the other one with the password. So um, see if you can find that. And uh, that is me. Um, hopefully that was useful.